going to talk about acute and chronic pancreatitis. Thank you very much for inviting me today. I have no disclosures. Uh, so just briefly, a lot of our presentation, we'll talk a little bit about the pancreas, its functions. Uh, we'll talk about the acute pancreatitis, causes, um, and as well as chronic pancreatitis, and then briefly just touch upon pancreatic <coughs> cancer. Uh, so just to start off with the basics, so the pancreas is uh, located here. Uh, so it's an organ right in the middle of the abdomen. It's actually behind your stomach, kind of nestled in the back there. Um, it's composed of a few different sections. You might hear people talking about the head or the body or the tail of the pancreas. And uh, predominantly a pancreatic duct, which helps uh, drain the um, secretions and uh, five products of the pancreas. Uh, it's both a digestive, so it creates the enzymes that help you digest food, as well as an endocrine organ. So predominantly um, helping synthesize things like insulin. And we'll get to that in just a moment. Um, it's pretty small, if you look at um, here it looks pretty big, but in reality it's about 10 to 20 centimeters in size, and really not that big, it's about 100 grams. Um, when I look it up online trying to see what it, people would say it looks like, they say it looks like a pear kind of smashed, uh, or flattened, or a horseshoe. Um, I guess. Uh. <laughs> uh, so the pancreas has two primary roles, the first of which is to synthesize hormones to help our body function, so predominantly that's your insulin to help maintain your uh, blood glucose levels, your blood sugar levels. Um, and then uh, what we're going to talk about as well is the synth helps synthesize the enzymes which probably break down your food. Um, so that's your um, creon and things like that that we replace. So when your food enters your stomach, uh, when it enters into your small intestine, you have these little Pac-Men that are released from your pancreas and help you digest this food so you can be absorbed and gain weight. So is pancreatitis. So in general uh, terms, pancreatitis is just an inflammatory process of the pancreas. Uh, it can be either acute or chronic, which we'll get to in a few minutes. Um, and it's a very common uh, process. So acute pancreatitis occurs in about 275,000 people per year, and this was back in 2012. Uh, and over the next few slides, we'll chat about causes. Um, although diagnosis and management is a, a large portion of this topic, uh, we're not going to talk about it in this uh, presentation today. It follows in the subsequent ones. So just briefly, uh, acute pancreatitis, um, generally acute meaning sudden or uh, acute onset is an isolated episode. These acute changes in the pancreas of inflammation, and generally it's non-progressive. Usually the pancreas will heal and you won't see changes. Uh, versus chronic pancreatitis, this is when you start seeing progressive changes uh, over time to the pancreas. You'll see permanent changes as well. And then you'll start to see impairment of your uh, pancreatic function, so loss of the endocrine capability, so development of diabetes, or loss of your ability to break down and digest food. So the typical patient that we might see in the hospital for acute pancreatitis, um, so this is patient AB, she's a 60-year-old uh, female, she's overweight, and has been experiencing intermittent abdominal pain for about five months after eating uh, fatty foods. Uh, she came to the hospital with an acute episode of this pain, so she had nausea, vomiting, and some yellow discoloration of her eyes. So acute pancreatitis, the symptoms, kinda, as we just saw in this patient, they can be sudden onset, usually in the mid or upper abdomen, uh, commonly or classically will radiate to the back, though not always. Uh, it may be alleviated when patients lean forward and often associated with symptoms such as nausea and vomiting. On physical exam, people appear unwell, uncomfortable. Um, they may have a hard time getting comfortable in the bed. Um, their abdomen might be very tender or painful when you examine them. Uh, although we're not going to talk about it, there are certain laboratory abnormalities that you tend to see in acute pancreatitis, uh, which you might not see in chronic pancreatitis. These are things such as lipase, amylase, and elevated liver function, um, but we won't get into that in too much detail today. Uh, although pain is a classic symptom, it can be absent in up to about 5 to 10 percent of patients. Um, so we never can hang our hat on the absence or, abs or presence of pain. Um, this is going to talk on imaging, just what we might see if we were to do some imaging. So this is a CT scan on the left. You can see my uh, nicely drawn squiggly line uh, outlining the pancreas here. Um, and versus on the right, this is a patient who has acute pancreatitis with different changes you might see, but this, I won't get into the details, but see it's more kind of hazy and um, more difficult to see the clear delineation that you can see on the left side. So when we diagnose someone with acute pancreatitis, we always start to wonder about what's the cause. Um, so when you look it up online, there's a, quite a laundry list of different things that can cause um, acute pancreatitis. And we'll go into some of the more common ones. Unfortunately, what I'm not going to talk about, which is always my favorite if you look at here, is your scorpion venoms. Um, <laughs> hopefully there are no scorpions in uh, Louisiana, but uh, something to keep in mind. 
Uh, so the most common cause of acute pancreatitis is your gallstone pancreatitis. So um, your gallbladder um, is seen here. And often gallstones are formed uh, basically a byproduct of uh, kind of stasis or when the uh, fluid stays in the gallbladder. It's a combination of different products such as uh, calcium, cholesterol, uh, bile pigments, which are a breakdown of your blood cells. And although these are very common, so you can see gallstones in up to about 10 to 15 percent of adults, and about 20 percent of these patients, you can have symptoms of gallstones. This is what gives you acute cholecystitis or inflammation of your gallbladder. And also, this in about three to seven percent of these patients, so a smaller portion, these gallstones can migrate out of the gallbladder down through the biliary tree and can sometimes get stuck at the end. So what can happen um, is that these gallstones can get stuck and through different processes can cause infl inflammation or development of acute pancreatitis. Um, so this is the most common cause. It can develop in about uh, 40 to 70 percent of patients with acute pancreatitis, but really only about 3 to 7 percent, as I mentioned, are patients with gallstones will develop uh, acute pancreatitis. The second most common uh, the uh, cause of pancreatitis or acute pancreatitis is alcohol. Um, this can occur in up to about 25 to 35 patient, uh, percent of patients with acute pancreatitis. Uh, and this generally does require a significant amount of alcohol intake. It's not usually one person who goes out uh, and has one episode of drinking. Usually you need pretty heavy, so about 10 to 11 drinks a day for several years, upwards of five to 10 years. Um, so, and this, the mechanism for this is generally an acute kind of toxic effect of the alcohol on the pancreas. And similarly with the gallstones, where many patients will have this but not develop acute pancreatitis, it's similar with alcoholics, uh, and then only about 2 to 5% of alcoholics will actually develop acute pancreatitis. So we talked about the most common causes, your gallstones, your alcohol. There's a, as I showed a few slides ago, there's many others. So some of the things we start to think about is metabolic, so elevated triglyceride or fat level. This isn't just slightly elevated. Usually this has to be pretty uh, highly <coughs> elevated to cause acute pancreatitis, but we do see it occasionally in the hospital. Uh, infections, there's quite a few, um, but the one we always think about or classically is uh, mumps and things like that. Uh, trauma, so abdominal trauma or the injury or uh, the <coughs> abdomen or uh, something of that nature can cause acute pancreatitis. Uh, medications, which we'll get into in a moment. And then there's always that black box of unknown causes. So this is the yeah, unknown cause of pancreatitis can really still account for up to about 15 to 25 percent of patients. So when you look up medications that can cause acute pancreatitis, it really is a laundry list. Uh, when I looked up one article, it talked about 44 out of the top 100 prescribed medications uh, in the U.S. have been implicated in acute pancreatitis. But this really is a very rare cause. Only about less than 5 percent of patients with acute pancreatitis uh, can really track it down to a medication. Uh, but some of the medications we always think about are things like hydrochlorothiazide. This is your uh, one of the more classic medications we use for um, high blood pressure. Uh, azathioprine is a medication we often would use for immunosuppression. Valproic acid, these are uh, medications we sometimes use for mood stabilizers or for, st um, for seizures. Your narcotics and your opioids, morphine, and things like that, and steroids. So something we always think about, but it, we really have to exclude other causes first. So just to loop back on our patients, so this patient, Miss AB, she's uh, meets a few of the kind of typical symptoms we would think for your biliary causes or your gallstone cause of pancreatitis. She's older, she's overweight, um, uh, and female, and she has these classic symptoms of kind of waxing and waning episodes of abdominal pain, often due to gallstones, and then presenting finally with severe pain and some jaundice as well. Uh, so transitioning into chronic pancreatitis, so this is one of the type of a classic patient we would see with chronic pancreatitis in the hospital. So a 40-year-old gentleman, he's alcoholic, drinking about a 12 pack of beer a day for about 15 <coughs> years, been hospitalized multiple times for acute pancreatitis, and coming in with an episode of abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. So the main difference, as we already talked about, with chronic pancreatitis versus acute pancreatitis is that chronic uh, pancreatitis really involves chronic inflammatory changes of the pancreas. This causes permanent changes uh, to the pancreas as well as impairment in the pancreatic functions, your um, insulin and your ability to digest um, the food you eat. Uh, symptoms can be pretty similar to acute pancreatitis. You can see abdominal pain. Um, this can occur in discrete episodes, but really as time goes on, these episodes of the, the abdominal pain episodes can really just become continuous and you might not see the cyclical or uh, breaks in the symptoms. And then the pancreatic insufficiency that we talked about earlier. Uh, there are other complications which we're not going to get into today. Uh, in my talk, we do get into those later on. Um, 
So chronic pancreatitis, so if you remember back a few slides ago, on the left side is our normal pancreas. And we can see different changes, but this is some of the more classic changes we'll see in the pancreas on the right, um, where you can see all these bright spots. All these bright spots here, these are all actually calcifications that have our response to the chronic inflammation uh, that developed in the pancreas. So causes for chronic pancreatitis are fairly similar, um, at least um, with some respect to the acute pancreatitis. Uh, instead of gallstones being the most common, we have alcohol as the most common. Uh, then we see it start to talk about other causes, which are hereditary causes, uh, causes of problems with your uh, pancreatic duct. Uh, and we'll get into those in just a few moments. Uh, your systemic diseases, so things like your uh, lupus or your autoimmune pancreatitis, uh, smoking becomes a very strong risk factor for chronic pancreatitis, both <coughs> independently and, as we'll talk about in a moment, in collaboration or additive to your alcohol uh, history. And similarly, with acute pancreatitis, there's still a large portion of patients with an idiopathic cause where we just don't know. Right. Um, so for alcohol, this is our most common cause. It's usually will occur in about 60 to 70 percent of patients. But similarly with acute pancreatitis, only about 5 to 10 percent of alcoholics will actually develop chronic pancreatitis. Um, and just to highlight briefly, really the primary care for these patients you have to consider is alcohol abstinence. So for those patients who continue to abstain, or who successfully abstain for alcohol, they still have a high risk, about 14 percent chance of developing chronic pancreatitis. But if you're able to, but that's as opposed to patients who continue to drink where you're still very higher, or much higher risk of about 41 percent. As I mentioned just briefly a moment ago, smoking is an independent risk factor for chronic pancreatitis, but in addition to alcohol, it does increase your risk. Uh, so one of the other causes that's very debated, but uh, uh, something I want to mention briefly is pancreatitism. So this is one of your ductal causes of uh, chronic pancreatitis. This is generally uh, thought to be due to abnormal pancreatic development. So you can see here on the right, um, my, so we have two pancreatic ducts. So the main pancreatic on the top, uh, the way that they form is you have one going down the tail of the pancreas and coming out this major papilla. So this is the general pathway that uh, pancreatic uh, enzymes will secrete. So kind of the pathway of least resistance for that Pac-Man. Uh, in pancreatic division, you have the divided pancreatic duct. So instead of going sh straight across and down, now these two ducts are separate. So instead of going down, you come out straight across. And this is a smaller pathway, so a smaller duct. Um, so now you go straight across. And the thought being here is that you have a large volume of pancreatic juice coming out of a very small duct, and this could cause um, obstruction and cause inflammation of the pancreas. As I mentioned, this is a very debated topic, still very hot in the medical literature, whether this is a strong cause for chronic pancreatitis. Um, so I just want to highlight that. Uh, it is the re part of the debate for this is that it's the most common um, congenital abnormality of the pancreas occurs in about 10% of patients, but really only about 5 to 10% of patients with pancreatic division develop uh, problems with chronic pancreatitis. So it's not uh, definitive that that's the cause. Uh, hereditary pancreatitis is another co uh, common cause of chronic pancreatitis. Uh, so just briefly talk about the mechanism of that. So as I've shown, um, you have ducts uh, that are into the ducts are secreted pancreatic enzymes, and these are then through uh, various mechanisms secreted into your uh, small intestine here, which is your duodenum, to help digest your food. Uh, one of the main enzymes that helps digest these foods is called trypsin, uh, and its inactivated form is called trypsinogen, and that's what's stored in these acinar cells. Normally, that's secreted uh, when your body tells you that, uh, tells your gland pancreas that's been eating, comes into the duodenum where in the small intestine, it's activated into its uh, active form of, of trypsin. And this is what helps you to consume your food. In hereditary pancreatitis, one of the mechanisms that's thought to um, cause the um, chronic pancreatitis is really premature activation. So instead of this enzyme being activated in your small intestine, it becomes activated in the pancreas, causing a kind of an auto-digestion or kind of consumes the pancreas itself. And that's one of the mechanisms believed to cause chronic pancreatitis in these patients. So I'm not going to go into too much details, but uh, some of the genes we start to think about or that you'll read about online, so you have your cationic trypsinogen gene, and you have your PRSS1. Usually these patients have strong family history, usually one of your parents uh, has this or uh, further there up. And this is a really an abnormality of that first gene. So that's instead of um, needing to be activated, it will be activated by itself. The other one that we often hear about is the SPINK1 
um, or serine peptidase inhibitor uh, casal type 1. That's pink one's a little easier to, to say. Uh, and this is kind of working on the other end. So this is a molecule that normally when active, acting properly will prevent uh, that trypsinogen from being activated um, until it's in the right location, until it's in the testin. Um, mutations in two of these genes will often cause this, this protein not to work, so you have activation within the pancreas. Uh, another common cause genetically is cystic fibrosis. Acts in a different way. Um, won't get into too much detail, but cystic fibrosis has problems with um, development of secretions in the uh, pancreatic gland, causes very viscous secretions and things like that. So many causes for chronic pancreatitis in our patient that we talked about, uh, this is kind of your classic patient who would present with uh, recurrent alcohol, uh, alcoholic episodes of acute pancreatitis, who's now developed into more of a chronic pancreatitis. So one of the, um, just briefly to touch upon it, pancreatic cancer, this is one of the fear complications of patients with uh, chronic pancreatitis. Um, and in general, uh, it's a fourth leading <coughs> cause of cancer-related deaths, uh, and very, unfortunately has a very poor mortality uh, survival. Um, has many causes as well, and just touch upon a few. Smoking, similarly, um, is a bad risk factor for many cancers, including pancreatic cancer, occurring in about, up to about 25% of patients. Uh, family history for pancreatic cancer, you'll see about first-degree relative pancreatic cancer in about 5 to 10%. And when you start to look at our patients, so our chronic pancreatitis here, it's a rare cause, but it does occur in up to about 5% of patients. In our hereditary pancreatitis, uh, these patients will develop about a 40% lifetime risk up until about 70 years of age of developing pancreatic cancer. And that's it for today. Thank you very much for uh, coming.